Hello, I'm Jill Barkan, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum's Senior Philanthropy Officer in the Northeast region. Thank you for joining us for today's program, Preserving Holocaust History. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping notes. Closed captioning is available. To enable this option, please click the CC icon at the bottom of your screen. Also, we encourage you to ask questions using the Q&A function. We'll try to answer as many as possible near the end of the program. As the National Memorial to the Victims of the Holocaust, the museum's mission is to ensure Holocaust education and resources are accessible around the world. In addition to the work you may know of, we also lead in the new field of genocide prevention, working with governments and policymakers the military, the judiciary, and others, and we run other programs that make the lessons of the Holocaust relevant to today's world. The museum's Northeast office brings its work to communities in New Jersey, New York, and across New England. We are particularly engaged in Boston, where there is a large and active community of survivors. We work with many local educators in New England, providing tools and training to help them teach the history and continued significance of the Holocaust. Thank you for joining today's program. Now I'd like to introduce our event chair, Mike Ross. Mike is the son of the late Steve Ross. He's a former Boston City Councilor. He's with Prince Lobel Tai. His father, Steve, survived 10 concentration camps and was rescued by American soldiers at Dachau. He is a longtime supporter of the museum and a former member of the museum's presidentially appointed council Please welcome Mike. Thank you, Jill, uh, and hello, everyone. <clears throat> I'm so pleased to be here and to welcome you all as the chair of today's event. The Holocaust Museum is an institution that means a great deal to me, and I am glad to have the opportunity to share its work and mission with my fellow New Englanders. I wanna thank the American Association of Jewish Holocaust Survivors and the JCRC for their help in spreading the word about today's event. For survivors and their descendants, most of whom lost every physical possession known to their family and generations before, and who came to this country with barely a possession, the notion of parting with even one or two of these artifacts can be gut-wrenching. In some cases, that bit of paper might be the only thing left of an entire village. My family and I are going through this process right now as we go through the few photos and papers that my late father, Steve Ross, brought back with him. As hard as this process may be, I know that each item is a link to a lost world a piece of evidence of humans' greatest crime against humankind, a possible clue to help someone learn more about their family. I also know that there is no one else in the world who is more capable or trusted to care for these materials than the people of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. We are in a race against time to rescue evidence of the Holocaust, and I am proud to join in this important effort to preserve this history and make it accessible to new generations. Today's speakers are joining us from the museum's National Institute for Holocaust Documentation, which is responsible for one, of the, for one of the world's largest collection of record of the Holocaust. The items in the museum's collection document the events of the Holocaust and help us understand the relevance of this history. And now I'd like to introduce today's speakers. Fred Wasserman and Deanne Afumato. Fred is the museum's acquisition curator with a focus on the Northeast. His exhibitions have been honored with awards from the International Association of Art Critics, 
the American Association of State and Local History, and the Society of American Archivists. Deanne is a chief of the Museum's Holocaust Survivors and Victim Resource Center. She first came to the museum nearly 20 years ago as a research fellow and is the author of several books and numerous articles related to the Holocaust. Please welcome Deanne and Fred, and Fred will be our first speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for that nice introduction. And thanks to all of you who are spending their lunch hour with us. In my seven years working as an acquisitions curator for the Holocaust Museum, I've met with hundreds of donors to our collection. And I'm pleased to be able to speak to you today because as Mike just mentioned, we are in the midst of an intensive effort to rescue the evidence of the Holocaust, particularly as the wartime generation passes. The museum collects documents, letters, photographs, artwork, and artifacts related to the period of Nazi occupation, the war years, and life in the displaced persons camps. We also collect home movies and music, as well as oral histories and memoirs. We document the lives of victims who were displaced, persecuted, and discriminated against by the racial, religious, ethnic, social, and political policies of the Nazis and their allies. The museum also collects materials related to witnesses, bystanders, perpetrators. The story of Americans in the Holocaust is another focus, including many GI collections. Potential donors contact us through the museum's website, as well as by telephone, letters, and email. Sometimes they even approach museum staff in the lobby wanting to speak to someone about their memorabilia. Prior to the pandemic, we were very busy and typically acquired one or two collections a day. And it didn't let up in March 2020 when the museum closed due to COVID-19. Working from home, the curators have been able to work with donors remotely by phone, email, and video conferencing. And this has worked out surprisingly well. During the pandemic, we have identified more than 500 new collections that we are in the process of acquiring. When the curators meet with donors and their families, we gather information so that we can write a short biography about the survivor and their family's experiences during the Holocaust. This way we are documenting the backstory behind a letter, a passport, or a child's doll. And this information travels with the artifact. Here you see me meeting with Norman Miller, who at age 15 left Germany on a kinder transport to England, just three days before the outbreak of war on September 1st, 1939. In addition to exhibitions, the museum's collections are used in myriad ways, in publications and educational curricula, films and television shows in order to lend authenticity, and in loans to other museums. The collections are actively used by scholars, researchers, and the general public. Many of our holdings can be viewed on the museum's website at www.ushmm.org. And in this way, we are able to reach a global audience. Here you see the webpage where you can search our collection. The heart and the soul of our collection are the documents, photos, and artifacts that reveal the stories of individual families. So today I'd like to share three collections that were donated by people in the Boston area or have links to the city. And I'm very happy to say that some of the donors and their families are joining us online today. Michael Grumbaum was from a wealthy Jewish family in Prague. We see him and his sister on the right and his parents on the left. His father was a successful attorney who was in England in March, 1939, when Germany invaded Czechoslovakia. He quickly rushed home to protect his family. But in 1941, Michael's father was arrested by the Gestapo and executed. The following year, Michael, his mother Margaret and his sister Marietta were deported to Terezin, also known as Theresienstadt. 
More than 60 years later, in 2006, Michael Grumbaum donated a collection that features two particularly noteworthy items, a large scrapbook with a burlap cover that his mother, Margaret Grumbaum, assembled, which we see here, and Michael's own memory book with autographs from his friends in Terezin. To the world at large, the Germans promoted Theresienstadt as a model camp ghetto through deceitful propaganda. But Margaret and Michael's treasured compendiums give us windows onto the actual lives of those who were imprisoned in the camp. They are also important because unlike most of their fellow prisoners, the Grumbaum survived despite the odds. More than 80% of the Jews who were transferred to Terezin, including approximately 90% of the children, were murdered, either there or in other camps further east. Margaret Grumbaum saved almost every piece of paper from her time in the camp, receipts, notifications, flyers, stamps, artwork, postcards, and other documents from wartime Terezin. And after she was liberated, she compiled all of this ephemera into an album. An assemblage like this is an extraordinarily complete record of life in the camp, as it documents work assignments, ration cards, and other bits of daily activities. A particularly significant page features these two yellow stars that the Grumbaums had to wear in Prague after the Nazis took over. Our conservators have since removed the scotch tape, which needless to say, is not good for long-term preservation. We also see the numbers 977, 978, and 979. These were the deportation orders for Margaret, Michael, and Marietta to be sent to Terezin. And at the upper right is a postcard of the ghetto camp that Margaret acquired after their liberation. At the camp ghetto, Margaret worked in the toy factory making teddy bears that were sent to the Reich for Christmas. So in the fall of 1944, when the Grumbams were put on a deportation train to Auschwitz, Margaret said to her supervisor, if I'm on that train, we won't finish the order. And so she and her children were allowed to get off the train. And in her scrapbook, Margaret preserved both their order to go to Auschwitz and also the letter taking them off the train. It's just amazing that things like this survive. It would appear that the interest in preserving one history ran deep in this family because the other major item in this collection is 13-year-old Michael Grumbaum's memory book entitled Pomotnik, created by him and his friends while living in the boys' dormitory in Terezin. The book features drawings, poetry, and autographs from Michael's closest friends. One of them made this wonderful drawing of Mickey Mouse. The translation of the page reads, quote, measure twice, cut once, in memory of my home Nesharim, your friend Martin. In Hebrew, Nesharim means eagles, and this is the name that Michael's group of some 40 boys coined for themselves as they found friendship and community in the midst of their confinement in the camp ghetto. Many of the pages are typical of autograph album entries. You see this hot horse and building on the left with well wishes, poems, and drawings. But others are haunting. The page on the right shows a drawing of a train headed downhill from Terezin to Birkenau, where a policeman is waiting to greet it. Okay. Wait a second. Oh. Just a sec. Sorry about this. A little bit. Okay. The text on this page reads Until the time improves and I will be home again, remember me, your friend Coco Heller. We know that Coco was deported to Auschwitz in October 1944 and murdered at the age of 13. Ada Breitkopf. 
Abrahammer and her parents lived in Krakow, Poland, when Germany invaded in 1939. Ada, an only child, was 18 years old. Her father, Gustav, fled east under the common assumption that only men were in danger. Ada, her mother, Erna, and her grandmother remained at home until they were forced into the Krakow ghetto in April 1941. In this round photo, we see Ada in the ghetto that year. It's even annotated on the back in her own hand. Shortly before the ghetto was liquidated, Ada's grandmother passed away. And in March 1943, Ada and her mother were sent to the Plashoff concentration camp. After a month spent under horrific conditions, they were selected to work in Oskar Schindler's airplane parts factory, where they were for more than a year. And then Ada was sent back to Plashoff. In October 1944, she was deported to Auschwitz, where she stayed for only three weeks before being sent to a sub camp where Ada worked in a flax spinning factory. Her mother was sent to different concentration camps and died in the Skarszysko Kamina slave labor camp in 1944. Ada was finally liberated by the Russian army on May 6, 1945. After liberation, she briefly went to Krakow before making her way to the Bindermichel displaced persons camp near Linz, Austria, where she met Raphael Abrahammer, a jeweler who had fled east and was held in Russian prisoner of war camps. They married on March 30th, 1947, and immigrated to the US in October 1948. Among the many photos in the Ada Abrahammer papers is this one on the upper right of Ada in the DP camp, and below that, Ada aboard the steamship USS General Black en route to the United States. Throughout her ordeal, Ada kept a diary recording her experiences. It was confiscated on three occasions, but to quote her, miraculously, I was able to get it back each time. And now I would like to play a short clip from an oral history that Ada Abraham gave in 1989. She is reading a passage from her diary about life in the Plashoff concentration camp in the fall of 1944. The original is in Polish, but here Ada reads from her English translation of the diary. Everybody flags together around the oven. They are cold. The delicious smell of soup pleasantly tickles their nostrils. Suddenly, zex, which means attention. What is it? Somebody is passing by the latrine, some over or under or some other such pest. Instantaneous silence falls upon the latrine. Pest, and again the clatter goes on. Often the German couplemen comes in without warning and chases everyone out. This creates a small commotion. The ones that choose to stay quickly raise their dresses and sit on the first unoccupied toilet. Who is bashful here? We? Or maybe he, the capo? And exactly that is why life here is so horrible. Because it is stripped of everything that is human and normal because whoever would believe me if I tried to tell all that. Exaggeration, one will say. I have written the, this there and then. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, all true. Is it normal to cook and to eat your meal in the bathroom? Can anyone imagine the macabre picture of an average evening in camp where up there you see the blazing flames, they are burning the dugout corpses, and here on the camp pathway under the barrack windows there is given a concert. Here are the famous Krakow musicians that are playing sweet Vienna waltzes, hot chardashes, or sentimental tangos. Will he, to whom we tell our story, live true with us the moments full of horror, 
animal fear of death, moments full of dread, horrible nightmare. It is just amazing to have this kind of rare account written at the time that captures a survivor's life in forced labor, concentration, and displaced persons camps. And it is so striking that Ada, Ada clearly wrote her diary with what I would call an historical consciousness about the importance of the record that she was keeping. And indeed, according to Ada's daughter, Nora Abrahammer, quote, the diary was her life's obsession after the war, to bear witness to her experiences and the Holocaust. It was her dying wish that the diary be noted, donated to the museum. And it was my honor to then do that for her. In 2015, I met with Sigrid Jean Ansbacher Strauss, who donated a fascinating group of memorabilia that allow us to chart her story in great detail. When the situation for Jews became too difficult in the small town of Dinkelsbuhl, Sigrid's family moved to Frankfurt on Main in 1937. Here we see a photo of the Ansbacher family, as well as the yellow stars that they had to wear in 1939. Sigrid's older brother Manfred was sent by England to Australia. Sigrid and her other brother Heinz planned to join him there, but after they obtained visas, ships stopped sailing to Australia. In May 1942, Heinz was called for deportation and was killed in Majdanek at age 17. A few months later, Sigrid and her parents were deported from Frankfurt to Theresienstadt in September 1942. Two years later, in October 1944, Sigrid was to be sent from the camp to an unknown destination. Here on the left, we see the note that her mother Selma sent to the authorities at Theresienstadt, pleading with them not to send her daughter away, but they didn't listen. The Ansbachers didn't know where Sigrid was being sent, but at Theresienstadt, there were rumors about a place called Auschwitz. So before Sigrid left, she and her parents made up a code. If she ended up in Auschwitz, she would send them a postcard with her name signed in a particular German script. It's a modest piece of correspondence, but it's important because it shows that the Ansbachers didn't act like passive victims, but had agency and found a way to communicate under very difficult and unknown circumstances. The postcard was in its way, a small act of resistance. Sigur was only in Auschwitz for six days. Then she and other girls were sent to Kurzbach where they had to dig tank traps outdoors in frigid weather. From there, they will march more than 40 miles to Grossrosen concentration camp under the threat of being shot. And after 10 days there, Sigurd, Sigurd was shipped to Matassen and then on to Bergen-Belsen, where she was liberated by the British on April 15, 1945. Sigurd had some kind of typhus and she refused to stay in Germany. So she was sent to Sweden, where she was successively in a hospital or rehab center, and finally on her own, working in a chocolate factory while she tried to get emigration papers. Here we see Sigrid's Swedish photo album. She's the young woman in the top left photo on the right hand page. When I met with Sigrid, she told me how embarrassed she was by how short her hair was right after the war. And in the other photos, we can see her friends, refugees from a host of European countries. For her first few months in Sweden, Sigrid still didn't know what had happened to her parents or whether they had survived. But in August 1945, Sigrid's uncle James Anson, who was living in Boston, saw a copy of the Aufbau in which she was listed among the survivors in Sweden. 
This was a New York newspaper for German Jewish refugees. As you can see here, James Anson circled Sigrid's name in orange crayon and wrote hurrah in the margin. James Anson immediately wrote to his niece Sigrid in Sweden, telling her that her parents had survived to Reisenstadt and had returned to Frankfurt. This is that letter. You can see that he lived in Austin. In December 1946, Sigrid finally traveled to New York, where she was reunited with her parents, who had arrived six months earlier. I've actually stayed in touch with Sigrid Jean Ansbacher Strauss over the years, and she's on line with us here today with her daughter. And when I recently asked Sigrid why she had decided to donate her memorabilia to the Holocaust Museum, she said, I know that my collection is going to be preserved and it will be in a safe place. I hope other people will do the same thing, take advantage of being able to give their papers to the museum so that someone can always find them there and look them up. I think that Sigrid speaks for many of our donors. And in that spirit, if any of you or your families or your friends are survivors or victims of the Holocaust who have documents, photos, or artifacts that you may want to donate, the museum would like to hear from you. And there will be information on how to contact us at the end of today's program. And now I would like to hand over the floor to Dion, who will tell you about the museum's research services. Thank you, Fred. Fred showed you some private collections. As you know, the museum also acquired from institutions around the world. Personal and institutional collections are critical for research and are used by a large variety of people, scholars, researchers, teachers, documentary filmmakers, Holocaust survivors, and others. The museum built unique Holocaust-related collections, and I'm going to show you how those collections are used for research. Whatever we are able to find in our collections allows researchers to tell stories and to write history. Claire Zach and Nicolas Mario are two French historians who came to the museum in 2012 to trace the fate of 991 Jews from Lens in the north of France during the war. We helped them search our collections and piece together the stories of each of them. The book whose, whose cover you see is the result of this research and what they found at the museum. The upper right photo is Barbara Gluck, the director of the Mauthausen Memorial in Austria, who was a research fellow at the museum. She spent time searching biographies of former prisoners at Mauthausen and its subcamps for whom they did not have the documents in the Mauthausen Memorial. And the gentleman holding a print of his displaced person registration card considered this document as his birth certificate because he was born in a DP camp and does not have a regular birth certificate. You notice that these three research projects had different purposes but they were possible because all the collections are accessible in one place at the museum. If you're looking for information to tell the story of a person or a historical event, you can contact the Holocaust Survivors and Victims Resource Center staff. We will help you and we will search our collections for you. The museum has always provided research assistance, but everything changed in December 2007 when the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum became the national repository of the International Tracing Digital, um, sorry, the International Tracing Service Digital Collection, the ITS in short. There are definitely a before and an after because that collection brought a lot of new information, especially about individuals. The original documents are located in Bad Arolsen, Germany, where they are kept in various rooms and buildings, as you can see in this photograph. But the museum, um, at the museum, we searched the entire collection on our computers. So let me share with you how we use all those collections, including the ITS, to tell stories. In May 1939, 
The MS St. Louis left Hamburg, Germany with more than 900 Jewish passengers who had legal documents to go to Cuba. The museum has multiple collections, artifacts and archival materials thanks to which we can tell the whole story of the St. Louis from different perspectives. For example, here is a postcard of the St. Louis, a photo of Captain Gustav Schroeder, whose hat was donated to the museum by Herbert Carliner himself, a St. Louis survivor. And in our library, we also have a book written and signed by Captain Gustav Schroeder. Each of those four items reflects the, a different aspect of the story. The museum also has hundreds of photos from the St. Louis. Most of them were taken by the passengers. Here you see Siegfried Schraplewski and his two sons posing on the deck of the vessel. In Germany, Siegfried worked as a plant manager of a furniture company. When he boarded the St. Louis, he and his family had hoped to escape Nazi persecution and to start a new life on the other side of the Atlantic. After the ship was turned back by the Cuban government and had to return to Europe, the family found refuge in Belgium. Following the German invasion in May 1940, Siegfried was rounded up as an enemy alien. He was sent to an internment camp in southern France. After the Germans occupied the south of France in November 1942, Siegfried continued to be held only then as a Jew until his transfer from um, the internment camp of Casnoy to Drancy. Then, from Drancy, he was deported to Auschwitz on September 9th, 1942, as you can see on this page of the deportation list. Siegfried was liberated from Buchenwald when he had, uh, where he had received prisoner number 125460, as this document shows. After liberation, he returned to Brussels, Belgium, but died four years later in 1949 from complications of multiple sclerosis. In August 1950, Siegfried's wife and her two sons immigrated to New York. Here is another story that we can tell thanks to our various collections. This white wedding dress was worn by Lily Lacks for her marriage to Ludwig or Aaron Friedman on January 27, 1946 in a synagogue near Seller Displaced Persons Camp in Germany. Lily told Aaron that she had always dreamed of getting married in a white dress. So he managed to find a white rayon parachute from a former German airman for two pounds of coffee and cigarettes. Lily used her cigarette rations to hire a seamstress, Miriam, to sew the gown. Miriam used the leftover material to make a shirt for Aaron that you will see in a few minutes. Six months later, Miriam, um, I'm sorry, six months later, Lily's sister wrote, um, wore the gown when she married, and then their cousin Rosie wore it. Lily lent the dress to many more brides, although she quit counting at 17. In addition to the dress, we also have in our collections this list of Czech DPs living in cellar on which Lily's name appears. You're also looking at the card of the location service of the American Joint Distribution Committee, the JDC, in the Bergen Belsen DP camp. Those cards were created to help tracing missing persons and the JDC's employees used them to note information that they had gathered on Holocaust survivors. During the war, Lili, her father Yitzhak, and young siblings had been deported from Munkach, Hungary to Auschwitz in the summer of 1944. Her father and two brothers were murdered upon arrival. Here is, it, um, here is Aaron's shirt made from the leftovers of the parachute fabric. Aaron was confined to Monkach ghetto and then deported to Auschwitz and Bergen-Belsen. Aaron's parents um, and seven siblings were murdered. More than a year after their marriage, Aaron, Lily, their baby daughter, and Lily's sister, Eva, were still in the DP camp to celebrate Rosh Hashanah in September 1947. The four of them finally boarded, boarded the SS Marine Flasher in Bremen to come to New York in February 1948. Such collections are used daily by the Holocaust survivors and Victims Resource Center staff to provide people with information about individuals. Let me share with you the story of Ben Lee's grandmother. Ben was the first digital humanities fellows at the museum 
where he became interested in the international tracing service collection and worked with us to improve access to it. But when Ben saw the documents that we found about his grandmother, suddenly the ITS materials were not just archival documents. Ben's grandmother, Rita Shore, was born on April 16, 1927 in Borislav, then in Polish Galicia near the Carpathian Mountains. Today it is in Western Ukraine. In 1939, Borislav fell under Soviet occupation, which lasted until 19, 1941, when the German army took over the town. Two ghettos were quickly established. Rita and her family successfully avoided the first deportations from the ghetto in 1941 and 1942. At one time, Rita and her family went into hiding in the Carpathian Mountains. By definition, hiding does not leave any trace in the documents, but her name also appears on the list of Jewish forced laborers in Lemberg, today's Lviv. The family was separated from one another many times and moved between hiding locations. But in the summer of 1944, their latest hiding place was disclosed by a local and Rita and her family were deported to Auschwitz in August. Rita received prisoner number A24883, as you can see on this page from the book of Polish Jews deported to Auschwitz concentration camp. When she arrived in Auschwitz, Rita was separated from her mother and sister who were immediately murdered. With her aunt, Eda, Rita was set to hard labor. In late 1944, Rita became very ill. Too weak to walk, she was wrapped in blankets by her aunt Ada and hidden under one of the bunks in the barracks in order to spare her. Ada was forced to go on a death march, but Rita was liberated by Soviet soldiers in, 19, in January 1945. Rita lost her mother, father, sister, and her grandparents as well as most of her extended family, including her numerous aunts, uncles, and cousins. After liberation, she spent almost a year recovering her health, first in a Red Cross hospital, then in Radom under the care of nurses. She was discovered on the Red Cross survivor list by a cousin who brought her to Munich in 1946. She attended her local Hebrew Technische Hochschule where a teacher advised her to apply to colleges in the United States. She applied to Pembroke College in Providence, Rhode Island, where she was accepted on a full scholarship. As she said herself, she was given the opportunity of, for a new life. As you can see on this ship manifest, Rita left Bremerhaven on January 1951 and traveled to New York on the ship General Blatchford. She graduated in 1953. During this time, she studied history and international relations and was awarded an internship at the United Nations, an experience she would always treasure. After graduating from Pembroke, Rita went on to Radcliffe College for her PhD studies at Harvard's Russian Research Center. Rita spent her career teaching history and languages. She's fluent in seven languages. Rita is currently 94 and resides near her family in Hartford, Connecticut. We're delighted to have Rita's daughter, Emily, and grandson, Ben, attending our program today. Ben kindly made a short video to tell you what it meant to him to discover his grandmother's documents. Hello, my name is Ben Lee, and I am the grandson of Rita Shore, a survivor of auschwitz birkenau concentration camp. In 2017 to 2018, I had the opportunity to serve as the Digital Humanities Associate Fellow at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, where I was fortunate to get to know the staff at the Survivors and Victims Resource Center. In particular, I was able to shadow staff members as they process requests on not only my grandmother, but also many of her family members. Over the past decade, I've begun a personal journey as a third generation survivor and learning about my grandmother's story by speaking with her and listening to her recount her life. Along this journey, I've also been in search of documentation and records pertaining to my grandmother and also to her family members, most of whom did not survive the Holocaust. For this reason, the documentation that the staff members in the Survivors and Victims Resource Center were able to discover has been incredibly meaningful for myself, my grandmother, and our family. Through this documentation, I was able to ask my grandmother new questions about her life. The experience of receiving and reading these documents with my grandmother is one that I will always cherish, and I am forever grateful to the Survivors and Victims Resource Center. The impact of this experience extends to my professional life as well. 
I'm currently a PhD candidate in computer science and engineering at the University of Washington, and much of my research concerns how we use machine learning to improve access to historic archives. Having the opportunity to shadow the Survivors and Victims Resource Center led me to pursue research toward improving discoverability of documents in the International Tracing Service Archive, and has shaped the past five years of my life rather drastically through my research directions as well. Thank you for listening, and I hope that you too will utilize the incredible resources offered by the Survivors and Victims Resource Center at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Now I'd like to share with you the story of a family reunion. It is not rare for us to be able to reunite people so many years after the Holocaust. Iris Tzafrir, who lives in Israel, contacted the museum several years ago to initiate a search on behalf of uh, and about her father, Yehoshua Lieblich, who survived the Holocaust. Iris also inquired about Yehoshua's siblings, who, according to what she knew, had all been murdered. The research started with the basic information that we need, a full name, a place of birth, and a date of birth, sometimes approximate or just a year. We found some documents about Yehoshua, who was deported from the Krakow ghetto to Auschwitz and later on was transferred to Buda Monowitz. In January 1945, Yehoshua was in Buchenwald where he was registered as a Schlosser, metal worker, and received a prisoner number 121757. On this Buchenwald effects card, you can see Yehoshua's signature. Liberated by the, uh, the US Army in April 1945, Yehoshua was registered as a displaced person by the Allied Expeditionary Force. When asked where he wanted to go, Yehoshua answered, Palestine. This was before the creation of the State of Israel in 1948. Then we continued the research with Yehoshua's sister, Leah, or Shendo Leah, for whom we had an exact date of birth. Based on the information provided by Iris Safrir, we found 58 pages of documentation. Like Yoshua, Leah was um, also deported from Krakow. She arrived at Buchenwald concentration camp on August 4th, 1944. But to our surprise, we found post-war documents indicating that she too had survived. She was in a DP camp near Egenfelden in Germany in August, 1946. And when asked where she wanted to go, she too stated, Palestine. Now I'm going to let Iris Safrir tell you the rest of the story and about the dramatic transformation took place in her family as a result of the research. Iris and her brother made a family video that we edited down for today's presentation. Thank you for your, your attention. And after the video, my colleague Jill will moderate Q&A. אני, אני עובדת על ספר, באמת ספר שהמטרה של הספר זה לספר לילדים שלי מה זה אומר להיות דור שני, ובתור זה לשלב את מה שההורים שלנו עברו, ובאמת להעביר לדור הבא איך להיות עם אומץ, ובאמת להמשיך בחיים, וכל הנקודה זה לחיות, לא לחיות בעבר, אלא לחיות קדימה בעתיד. ובמשך הספר הזה אני עושה כל מיני מחקרים. והיה לי איזו סוגיה שבדקתי אותה בקשר למתי שהמשפחה נכנסה לתוך גטו קרקוב. ישבתי מול המחשב, חשבתי, הסתכלתי, בדקתי. אמרתי, מי יעזור לי, מי יעזור לי? והחלטתי לפנות למוזיאון השואה בארצות הברית. והחלטתי פשוט לשאול שאילתות על כל האחים והאחיות של, של אבא, של סבא יהושע. וקיבלתי תשובות בחזרה, ופתאום האחות הגדולה שלו, שנדליה, בתשובה שקיבלתי ממוזיאון השואה בארצות הברית, הם שולחים לי... מעל 50 מסמכים. הייתי בשוק מוחלט. אני הגעתי למייל הזה, זה יומיים אחרי זה, באיזה יום ראשון לפני שבועיים, וישבתי מ-10 מ- בלילה, אני חושב עד 2, 3 לפנות בוקר, פתאום הבנתי, אני ראיתי שם שהתוצאה של מה שכתוב שם, שיש סיכוי סביר שהאחות שלי או שהוא החיה. אסף אחרי יומיים מתקשר, אומר, תשמעו, שנדל... לא נספתה בשואה, ולא רק זה, היא עלתה לארץ. אחרי זה, אחר הצהריים, הוא שולח לי תמונה של המצבה של שיינדל. הוא מתקשר אליי, אומר, תשמע, הסתכלתי בדפים שהעבירו לי חבר'ה קדישא, יש לה גם שני ילדים. בן ובת. בן ובת. הוא מקבל טלפון, וחנה יודעת שנסעתי לבקר. היא אומרת, אתה מוכרח לשמוע משהו חשוב. אמרתי, אני פה באמצע העניין, רק תשמע משפט שלא תופתע. 
תכף יצלצל לך מישהו, יש לך דוד. פתאום להרגיש שיש משפחה, ולחלוק איתם את החוויות, ולזוז קדימה, ולראות שיש עתיד עם משפחה, זו חוויה אחרת לגמרי. הם יצטרפו, ואנחנו נצטרף אליהם, ונמשיך. אני מרגיש שאני אגלול... Thank you. Thank you. That was a powerful video and testament to the importance of preserving this history. Before we close our program, we'd like to answer a few of your questions. Um, if you haven't done so yet, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And let me see what we have. For Dion, are all of the documents accessible online or only by visiting the museum? So some of the documents in our collections are accessible online um, and some of them are not and you will have to either come to the museum or you can contact us um, and we'll do the research for you and we will send you the uh, result of this research so um, and people after this presentation will receive an email uh, with um, the possibility to make appointments if they are interested in conducting research. Uh, they can make an appointment with a researcher and um, and we will do the research for them. And this is not just for families, this is for everyone. Uh, we help absolutely everyone, researchers, scholars, documentary filmmakers, so whoever is interested in conducting research about individuals can contact us and make an appointment with us. Thank you. Uh, Fred, this next one is for you. If we only have copies of photos and not the originals, are they still eligible for donation? And then secondly, are there specific items that the museum does not collect? Okay. Um, we collect original materials. So unfortunately, we do not collect copies. Um, occasionally, there are a few copies in a collection of originals. But, um, but the simple answer is no, we're an archive and a museum, we collect originals. Uh, and uh, in terms of what we don't collect, um, uh, you know, we typically, um, we don't collect materials that are really more relevant to the military history of the Second World War. Um, so, for example, um, weaponry, Nazi uh, sabers, um, and also the war booty that um, American GIs often brought home as souvenirs. Um, and we also uh, do not collect objects that were taken from protected heritage sites, which is the former concentration camps, for example. Thank you, Fred. Dion, one more question for you here. Is it possible to do research on my father if he's the only survivor of his family and he's no longer alive? What kind of information do, do I need to start this research? Uh, absolutely. Um, so you can start this research by contacting us. Again, you will have a chance to contact us um, after receiving this um, possibility, the link to uh, make an appointment with us. And um, the, the information that we need to start researching um, is a full name, uh, a date of birth. It can be just a year of birth, but at least a date of birth and, um, and a place of birth that could also be just a country. But if we don't have the full name, the date of birth and the place of birth, it's very difficult for us to start researching the collections because we, we are searching you know, millions of pages of materials. And, um, and you can just um, contact us after this presentation. Thank you. Another question that came in, are donated items on display at the museum or will they be archived and set aside? Uh, it's um, that's a, a kind of a complex question. We have uh, thousands, thousands and thousands of collections, more than a million pages of archival documents, etc. So not everything uh, can be put on display and we can never make guarantees to potential donors that their family's memorabilia uh, will be in 
our permanent exhibition. However, we use our collections in many, many different ways. They're used for, um, they're used for educational curricular. They are used in calendars. Uh, they are lent to other museums when they mount temporary exhibitions. Uh, and critically, every collection is reviewed by conservators to, so that they can be treated if they need preservation. Every collection is accessioned and there's a catalog record on our website so that people can find their ways to the collection is all searchable. So that if you put in a name, you, find the, you can find the collection. If you put in the name of a town, you will find collections related to the town. And we are really all about accessibility. So eventually um, we try to digitize collections and post them to our website so that they are widely available to anyone around the world with an internet connection. So, um, because the museum is really about making our collections accessible and technology has allowed us to move forward in this direction increasingly. Thank you, Fred. Uh, this question, I suppose, could be put to either one of you or both of you. Do you travel around the United States to either interview survivors in their homes or collect materials? Dion, do you want to go first on that? So in, in our department, um, what we do, uh, we offer research. So sometimes we, before COVID-19, we used to travel a lot to present and also to offer on-site research to meet with people. And during those uh, research appointments, um, sometimes people came with artifacts, with um, letters, photographs. Uh, so we always work closely with um, curators at the museum to make sure that uh, they would be in touch with the curator and they would be able to um, donate those artifacts and collections to the museum. Uh, we used to travel and we hope that we can travel again soon. And Fred, how do you collect? collect and well, um, two years ago today, <laughs> exactly March uh, 11th, this Wednesday, two years ago, I met with two donors and they were the last people who I was able to meet with in person. But prior to the pandemic, the curators would indeed uh, meet with donors in their homes or they would meet with donors uh, I've met with donors sometimes at the Northeast office across from Grand Central. Donors have come to the museum with their collection and have met with the other curators. And, uh, and it was a very, you know, it was a wonderful process of going through, hearing their stories, looking at things. Uh, it's important to note that the donors at this point are very, very often second generation or third generation uh, because the survivors now are, you know, mid eighties to well into their nineties. And, uh, and, you know, basically the world closed down and like everyone else, we had to pivot. And so we've been working with donors um, through many emails, telephone calls, and particularly uh, we now have uh, uh, Zoom and Google Meet in our toolbox. So we can actually have rather warm and one-on-one um, -on -one meetings with donors online. And they hold up things to the camera of their computers. And I say a little lower, or a little higher, left, right, but it works. And so, as I think I mentioned at the top of my talk, we, the curators have identified more than 500 collections. And, um, and as Dion said, we are certainly looking forward to be able to meet with donors um, you know, in the flesh because it's, it's a very, very special kind of relationship that one builds you know, with people when they are donating to the Holocaust Museum. And Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Uh, I think we might have 
time for just one more brief question, uh, but I would like to say that any anybody who sent in a question that has not been answered, we will get back to you uh, after this program. So please do stand by. Uh, so this last question, do you collect materials pertaining to the lives of survivors before or after the war or later in their lives, or is it just the period of wartime? Okay. Um... I think that people uh, in general um, are surprised at the scope of what we collect within, uh, within our um, collections mandate. Uh, we collect materials that are pre-war. We have extensive holdings that document pre-war Jewish life in Europe. Uh, we collect materials from wartime, of course. We, uh, are actively collecting um, uh, uh, materials from life in the DP camps and the whole immigration process we collect from many families. I mean, the collections I discussed today were about survivors who were in camps, but we collect materials from many families who were fortunate somehow to flee. Europe and, uh, and make it to the United States or to Australia, to Palestine, Israel, um, other places in Europe. And so it's a very broad collecting uh, mandate. And as I mentioned earlier, I believe, we also collect materials about the American response to the Holocaust. And I also just want to put a little pitch in, we have a home movies collecting initiative because it is wonderful to have that kind of grainy home movie footage that skips that really gives us insight into you know, life in Germany. Or I recently collected from someone in Vermont, home movies from the 1930s in the Netherlands of a family that in 1939 had to just flee to, uh, to France. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. And thank you, Dion. And a special thanks to Mike for uh, your help in bringing the museum to our New England community. Uh, we appreciate your joining us today. Thanks so much and enjoy the rest of your day.